All right. So um, hopefully you all can see my screen. We're going to get started. We have a lot to cover in an hour, which we usually do. So um, just good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is our September maternal webinar uh, where we're going to be talking about building your maternal heart team and we're going to uh, review the hypertension data and update to the data collection plan as well as the submission process. So there's a lot to cover. Um, we're going to start with the hypertension update just because we know we have um, some data folks joining just uh, for to hear this piece. Um, but we just encourage everybody to um, be part of the cardiac learning events like this one, um, even if you haven't signed up as an active cohort or not able to at this time, um, we have cardiac learning series planned through next summer, up to next summer. And so everybody, it's an, it, that learning series is open to all and we want all of our hypertension teams to participate in, um, in those. Um, so just some housekeeping issues. If everyone could just mute their line, that would be great. You can put your questions in the chat at any time. We're hoping that we're going to have, you know, more of a sort of roundtable discussion, um, informal discussion uh, later on after the hypertension update. So um, feel free to put your questions in the chat or wait till that time um, to the Q&A time. We're going to uh, record this and um, we'll send out the presentation um, shortly after this webinar. And then we'll also post everything on Microsoft Teams. Um, I just wanted to provide a few updates. We have a webinar planned for October 4th, and that topic's going to be cardiac physiology. And the speaker is Dr. Carolyn Duty um, at Emory. And we also have an additional learning event scheduled for October 5th, and that topic is going to cover maternal cardiovascular disease. This is going to be for Emory's MFM Grand Rounds. And that speaker is going to be Dr. Ashan Hamid, who's an OB and a cardi cardiologist. And she actually kicked off our cardiac learning series in March. And she's our physician, pretty much our, our lead for the national AIM um, work that we're engaged in with the cardiac conditions and obstetrical care bundle. So she's been our resource and we're really excited to have her. And um, Dr. Ellis has been um, graciously leading that effort and the planning for that. So um, we also just wanted to update you all on, on the next reporting um, due for hypertension, which is going to be for quarter three, 2022. So that's going to be due October 31st. And what we're going to review today, the updated metrics and the new submission process will apply to this submission. Um, so if folks that uh, aren't able to make it and they, they're the, usually the ones that handle data, this will be recorded and folks can you know um, access the recording and presentation later. I know many of you know, um, no. I've reached out to, to quite a bit of folks about this survey, um, but we are doing a cardiac, we have disseminated a cardiac consultation and referral network assessment survey. Um, and our goal here is to build a robust re referral network um, here in Georgia. And we're trying to collect um, those referral networks right now. And so we have, we've been working sort of with our AIM facilities, but this is open to non-GAP QC facilities as well. And so um, any, oh, I hear a little bit of reverb there, but um, so we're, we're hoping to collect as many um, responses from this. We have our improvement advisor who's, you know, been working with some of you. I'm sure you all um, have heard Shane Reed's name and he's been reaching out and doing a great job connecting with you all, um, but he can support you with completing this survey. There is a little bit to it, um, just knowing, you know, a little bit about your network and a little um, kind of the details to that. So there's there, there might be a need to reach out to your network, but we also plan to engage the Georgia chapter of the American, Co American College of Cardiology. Um, we're going to create a new version of this survey and we're going to attack it from both sides. So we're going to get it from the cardiology side and the OB side. Um, so, but more to come on that. We just appreciate your um, just completing that for us. That would be wonderful. And then we are actively recruiting for the cardiac initiative. And so we're going to be doing some onboarding calls for our active cohort. And the plan is for first data submission quarter four, 2022. So that would be due January 31st. And um, there's going to be more information that's coming out from this. And obviously on the onboarding call, we'll be able to um, tackle some of the questions our active cohort um, may be having regarding data. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Victoria Sannon, who's going to be talking about the hypertension update. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, my name is Victoria Sana, and I'm an epidemiologist within the perinatal health team here at DPH. Uh, today, we will discuss the recent updates to the severe hypertension metrics and the new data submission process uh, for these metrics going forward. Next slide, please. All right, so this is a brief overview of what I'll be covering. Um, first, we're going to start off with the burden in Georgia. After that, uh, we'll jump into the updates about the data collection plan and um, the uh, updates to the uh, severe hypertension bundle. Um, and lastly, I'll introduce survey one, two, three as the, the new reporting method going forward. All right, so um, this slide displays the process measures for hypertension. Uh, it displays the collaborative wide rates um, for this bundle um, from its launch in 2019 uh, to March 2022. As we can see, uh, tremendous progress has been made um, over the past few years. Uh, however, I do want to bring your attention to timely treatment of severe hypertension, which is shaded in the light blue as well as the implicit bias nurse education and implicit bias provider education shaded in orange, um, well, shaded in yellow and orange, respectively. Um, these three metrics are uh, beneath 50% um, for the collaborative wide rates, which indicates that there's still uh, plenty of room for improvement. Next slide, please. This slide displays the structure measures for hypertension. Um, again, these are the collaborative wide rates um, from the program's launch to March 2022. And as we can see, again, tremendous progress has been made, um, and we applaud you all um, at the facilities for this progress. Um, I just want to bring your attention to uh, metric number three, which is the multidisciplinary case reviews. Um, that is the one with 69.1%. Uh, There's still some room for growth, uh, as we can see, but again, I would just want to emphasize the amount of progress that has been made um, over the past few years. Next slide, please. All right, this slide provides a breakdown um, of severe hypertension treatment by race and ethnicity for Q1 2022. Um, we have the overall rates indicated in blue with the black outline, uh, non-Hispanic white in orange, gray indicates the non-Hispanic black, Hispanic in yellow, and other in uh, the light blue. Um, as we can see, there are slight variances across race and ethnicity, um, but the major uh, uh, the main point that I want to bring your attention to on this slide is the timely treatment of severe hypertension. Um, there's still plenty of room for growth in that area, and that's something that um, is also brought to our attention with the new uh, metrics that AIM has provided going forward. Uh, next slide, please. All righty. So for the purposes of this presentation, um, the outcome process and structure measures have been color coded. Blue indicates that the measures have been retained. So you would continue to report the measures as you have previously. Um, orange indicates that the measures have been slightly revised. Minor adjustments have been made to them. Red indicates that the process, well, that the measure has been removed. So these are measures that you have historically reported, but are no longer required to do so. And lastly, green will indicate that the measure is newly added, and um, we'll go into more detail about that. Uh, all of this information will be made available to you. Um, these slides will be provided to you after this webinar, as well as a summary of the revisions for the hypertension uh, data collection plan going forward. So in regards to outcome measures, uh, outcome measure one is shaded in blue, which indicates that it is retained, so you will continue to report this measure as you have previously. It is SMM excluding transfusion. Outcome measure two has been revised, and the only change that was made to this measure is the verbiage. 
So the language has been updated to more accurately reflect AIMS ICD-10 codes list used to subset the denominator. So instead of using hypertensive disorders in their verbiage, they are using the term preeclampsia. And that's the only revision that has been made to that measure. Outcome measure number three has been removed completely, so there is no longer any need to report a severe maternal morbidity with transfusions. Next slide, please. So for process measure one, um, shaded in blue, that would be, you would continue to report that as you always have. Um, process measure number two is newly added. So um, I would like to bring your attention. Uh, well, this this process measure would is purpose to bring your attention to the scheduling of postpartum blood pressure and symptom checks. Uh, this process measure has two prongs, the first of which is displayed here and brings a focus on individuals with severe hypertension during their birth admission. The second prong, next slide, please. The second prong brings attention to all other hypertensive disorders during pregnancy. Um, and so that's the only uh, distinction between the two prongs. And again, this is a new measure that you would begin reporting going forward. Um, next slide, please. Process measure three was revised um, and covers OB provider education. Again, this, well, this also has two prongs. The first prong covers um, what facilities have historically reported um, in terms of OB provider education. The second prong is where the revision came through. Um, and the second prong brings attention to respectful and equitable care. And that's something that AIM um, really wants to emphasize going forward, um, just the importance of that. And so now that's being added to the data collection process. Next slide, please. Process measure four covers OB uh, nursing education. And similar to the previous slide, the first prong, um, you would report it as you always have um, in terms of nursing education. The main revision, well, the only revision comes to uh, the second prong of this process measure, which again brings attention and uh, uh, emphasis to respectful and equitable care um, as it pertains to nursing education. Next slide, please. Process measure five is newly added, um, and this measure covers ED provider and nursing education on the signs and symptoms of severe hypertension and preeclampsia in pregnant and postpartum people. And the purpose of this is um, with the hope that this will faci facilitate timely recognition and response to emergencies in the ED. Uh, process measure six um, is the unit drills, and you would comp um, continue to report that as you have previously. Next slide, please. Uh, now we're moving on to um, the structure measures. Um, previously, with the structure measures, uh, you were posed a question, and you would provide yes or no, and uh, if yes, you would provide the date that that structure measure was implemented at your facility. Um, going forward, the responses to the structure measures will be reported on a Likert type scale ranging from one not started to five fully in place. And if five fully in place, then you would provide the date uh, of initiation or implementation rather. Um, and details on this scale will be made available to you um, after the webinar. Um, and you can always feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or concerns about that. Um, and so that rings true, that Likert scale rings true for all of the structure measures, and that is the main revision that has been made to these structure measures. Um, there have been slight changes to verbiage indicated in orange here, um, but uh, those are the major updates. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the fifth structure measure, uh, well, what was the fifth structure measure previously has been removed, which is EHR integration. 
And so that's a major change that's been made. Next slide, please. Instruction measures five and six are newly added. Um, and again, these are questions that you would just provide your response using that Likert type skill that will be provided. Um, and it ranges from one, not implemented or not started, to five, fully in place. All right, now we're going to shift to survey one, two, three. Um, so we are shifting to Esri Hub, which is a hub site that will house facility dashboards for each facility participating in the bundle. This hub site will provide facilities with the opportunity to self-report structure and process measures using survey one, two, three. One of the great perks about this is that it will allow you to view the data in real time. Um, before, you know, we would have to provide you all with the AIM reports and upload it, and then you can guys go and view it. But this, with this new uh, software that we're shifting to, will allow you to report your data and view it in real time. Next slide, please. So this is um, just a preview of what the survey will look like. As you can see um, on the left, we have the general information. So the reporter would input the hospital name, hospital ID, the, their name, email address, basic information. And then um, as you can see on the left as well, there's the severe hypertension bundle and then the cardiac uh, bundle. We're not focusing on the cardiac bundle right now because we haven't begun that data collection process. And I know you guys are gonna tap into that a little bit later, but. Right now, we're just going to focus on the severe hypertension bundle in terms of the process instruction measures that reporters will provide. Uh, next slide, please. So when you click on that severe hypertension bundle, uh, you will provide the date period that you will be reporting for. So Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and the year. Then you would click on the process and structure measures. Next slide, please. And when you do so, uh, the process measures would the questions for those would populate. So you would click on process measure one. In this instance, uh, we clicked on process measures three, and you would provide the response uh, to that question. And once you complete the survey, you would click submit, and that is the end of the process. Um, and so we shifted to this uh, survey format in hopes of easing the burden of reporting for facilities. Um, Again, I know this is a lot of information that we uh, jammed into this uh, brief presentation, but all of this information will be made available to you in addition to a more detailed and comprehensive summary of the changes to the data collection plan. And um, as always, uh, please feel free to reach out to me or our team um, with any questions or concerns, and we'll be glad to uh, address those accordingly. And now back to you, Lisa. <laughs> Thanks so much, Victoria. I know there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes um, to get this ready uh, to transition to this new, um, great, better way of doing things. So uh, appreciate all of you guys' patience. I know we had some testers out there that helped test some of this, and we've um, we just appreciate all the the patience with this. But this ultimately will um, be great for all of us um, internally, you know, internal teams, and with you all at the hospitals. Um, so. I, I don't think we have any questions in the chat right now. So if we do, just please, um, you know, you can reach out to me or Victoria um, via email if there's anything. But again, we're going to post all this information um, after this webinar, um, so you'll you'll know where to access it. Hey, Lisa, there is yeah. a question in the chat, real quick. This Lynn. So um, thanks, Dana. Yes. Oh, and thank you for um, letting me know there's something there. Um, yes, we are going to start this for quarter three. So the submission that is for October 31st will be will follow this. So there's going to be more information coming in the forthcoming weeks with all of this, um, as well as follow up from this webinar today with some of these um, details. And then Dr. Worrell has a question here. Can you clarify the metric changes on the timely treatment of severe hypertension? Victoria, did you want me to go back to that slide? Um, 
I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? Um, Dr. Worrell has a question here. Can you clarify the metric changes to the timely treatment of severe hypertension? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, so the severe hyper timely treatment of severe uh, hypertension, that process measure has remained unchanged, so you would continue to report it as you have previously. Um, and it's shaded in blue um, on those slides, and so all the process structure and outcome measures um, shaded in blue are things that you wouldn't have to worry about changing. Um, so. Thanks, Victoria. Absolutely, yeah. All right, well, moving on to our cardiac discussion. Um, as mentioned earlier, we're actively enrolling facilities in our next maternal initiative. Um, and so we had uh, reviewed this key driver diagram. Don't worry, I'm not going to go go through this in its entirety. I want to get to our, our speakers today. But we um, have received some initial feedback from informal discussions as well as um, the coaching conversations that our improvement advisor has been having just around potential hesitancy um, around the readiness components um, that may not be in place at all of the facilities um, as a reason for potentially not joining or enrolling in the initiative. So what we wanted to do is we felt like it was important for us to take more time on the readiness key drivers and clarify that teams do not need to have every intervention in place to enroll. In fact, the idea is that enrolling in the bundle is really the first step, right? It's the commitment to work on these key interventions um, as it aligns with your capabilities, right? Your maternal level of care and your capacity. So um, there's no one, um, you know, one approach to some of the, these interventions. And so today our discussion is really focusing on structure measure one, which you see is highlighted in red. Um, and this is building your multidisciplinary maternal heart team. And so, um, as many of you know, and Victoria just mentioned, structure measures are a date and time that a key bundle intervention has been met, but it's not a requirement to have this in place to enroll. Um, so it's understood that a structure measure is going to take a, some, it might take some additional time. There's going to be facilities that already have this in place, um, but there's going to be those that are going to need some additional time to get this in place. And so we just want to clarify that. Um, and so um, the next part of our discussion is really going to be talking about these approaches to establishing multi multidisciplinary heart team. So we're very fortunate to have three GAP QC partners willing to share their approaches today. We have Dr. Chad Byrne Ray, who's Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Vice Chair for Education, Obstetrics and Gynecology, Co-Director at AU Cardi Obstetrics at Augusta University Medical Center. We have Dr. Jane Ellis, Associate Professor of Maternal Fetal Medicine at Emory School of Medicine. She's a me Medical Director of the Emory Regional Perinatal Center at Grady Memorial Hospital. And we have Dr. Keisha Callens filling in for Heather Daniels today. I know there was some scheduling changes, but we so appreciate you, Dr. Callens. Um, Dr. Callens is a Joy McCann endowed professor. She's clinical assistant professor at Mercer University School of Medicine. She's an OBGYN at Community Healthcare Systems. So I just, I guess I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Ray, um, to help kick us off. But this is really an informal um, conversation. I encourage anybody who's joining today to um, share if you're having any, you know, hesitancy with this piece of the bundle or any challenges or any successes you'd like to share with the group. Thanks, Dr. Ray. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I'm happy to be on today. Um, I gave a talk at the Regional Perinatal Center uh, meeting, uh, I guess, a little over a week ago at Sea Island, and um, you know, was able to highlight a little bit about what we've done so far at Augusta University. Um, starting about June of 2021, um, we were able to um, get together a group of stakeholders and really create capacity for a partnership that included um, us trying to figure out how we could get our, um, you know, our higher risk maternal fetal medicine type patients with cardiovascular disease um, in. We took a very, you know, acutely a, an evidence-based approach that would allow us to um, try to reach uh, um, or at least make the highest amount of, um, of impact so we looked at specifically cardiovascular disease in the postpartum period initially, and um, our hope was is that we would be able to, um, you know, ultimately 
see where we, we had gaps and really evaluate us as partners with our cardiovascular colleagues. Uh, so Dr. Sharma, who is the head of our imaging um, for um, for cardio, cardio, the Department of Cardiology here and myself um, got together a small team and we initially just started creating capacity. We took our patients from labor and delivery um, that were had any kind of um, uh, hypertensive disease or cardiovascular disease of pregnancy um, or um, as if they had entered pregnancy with um, hypertension, for example, um, and we had them follow up week one with OB and week two with cardiology and Dr. Sharma initially um, was seeing the patients himself. Um, in year one, we saw about a hundred, I can't remember exact number right now, maybe 120 patients or so, um, just, just with him doing it. And then after about, after about six months, he had included a fellow. Um, and um, we, so our biggest issue with that was that we did not have a great way to make an impact on our no-show rate for the clinic. We had, you know, somewhere on the order of about a third of the patients were or no-shows. Um, and so, and this was just postpartum patients. And so we know that that's an issue postpartum in a lot of ways. Um, we were not doing telehealth um, at that time. And so we really focused on trying to um, do better with year, when, when we've gotten into July. And so in July, we've already seen about, we've seen more from July and August, we saw more than 50 patients already. Um, throughout that process, I decided to um, really uh, work with the state and, and the governor's budget. Uh, initially, we were able to um, get some money in for cardiobstetrics, a pilot program, uh, because we really had done a needs assessment and we realized we needed somebody for from an administrative standpoint. We needed a cardiac uh, nurse navigator uh, specifically for these patients, and we needed to um, find support for our cardiology partners um, to see patients. And so ultimately what happened was we, through the Department of Public Health, we were able to get funds um, to hire a nurse navigator, um, have a dedicated echocardiography machine, um, and by clinical uh, FTE, really, for uh, purposes of having our cardio cardiologists um, see patients. Um, we do take an approach where it's a tr uh, triad approach of academics, uh, research, and uh, clinical care. Um, our team consists of um, cardiologists, uh, multiple cardiologists now, um, including their fellows, um, obstetricians, we have gynecologists uh, for purposes of family planning, especially um, in cases where patients would uh, need long-acting reverse and co contraceptive, um, maternal fetal medicine, um, OB anesthesia, and that includes cardiovascular anesthesia. Um, we have a cardio we have two cardiothoracic surger surgeons um, that have participated, um, and we have a host of others that include NICU. Um, administrative support from both OB uh, and from cardiology, um, and we're hoping to hire a nurse navigator soon. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Ray. And I know that, you know, every every setting is different, right? So, um, you know, there's not one one uh, one approach to to doing this work. And so um, this is just one um, one strategy and one approach. Um, I'll just pause for a second if anybody has any questions for for Dr. Ray. Hey, Chad, it's Jane. I enjoyed your talk down at Sea uh, Island last week at the medical directors meeting. Has your perinatal center or Augusta actually formally join the cardiac bundle? Um, I don't know. We have not. Um, to my knowledge, I think our biggest problem is we've had a change in our own leadership. Carla Allen has switched over from obstetrics to cardiology, and I might have mentioned this, but she's the one who I've worked most closely with for probably the last six years. Um, and she's been on the GAP QC side, who knows, she knows, she knows everything. <laughs> And uh, my the great thing is is that she's actually switched over to cardiology, so she'll help us with the with the aim bundle for the for cardiac uh, cardiac conditions as well. But we have not yet uh, signed on, not that I'm aware of. Thank Billy. you. All right. 
Um, so I, I guess Dr. Ellis, this would be a good, good transition time for you to share you guys' efforts over at um, Emory Grady. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lisa. I appreciate the opportunity. And I'll be speaking just on the Grady side. Uh, I am not sure what's happening at Midtown or at the other facility, uh, Emory affiliated facilities like Emory Decatur. Um, and in full transparency, Grady also has not formally committed to um, joining the initiative, but Dr. Lindsay and I, I think, are meeting with um, women's health leadership in the near future about several issues, and this is one thing we'll break up, uh, we'll bring up. And thank you for sending the form to me yesterday, Lisa, so I can hopefully get it signed soon. Um, so I wanted to reflect on what Chad said. It really is going to be a big multidisciplinary um, team that's going to need to make this work. And there is a lot of interest at Grady on a number of um, services part to join the initiative and make it work. Because I think here at Grady, we've realized for quite a few years now that we have um, patients who do have cardiac issues, whether they're recognized or unrecognized. And it's not always clear that they are being recognized uh, in a timely manner and, um, you know, directed to the service that they actually need. A couple of years ago, we had an MFM fellow who unfortunately did not stay in the Atlanta area, along with two new, very young, very energetic cardiologists who wanted to uh, get together and form like a formal OB cards uh, clinic where a patient would be seen by an MFM uh, in clinic in the morning and then seen by cardiology in the afternoon. I think the plan had been for that to be one day a week, maybe two or three times a month. And we were getting around to getting the conversations going and a lot of interest in making that happen. And we felt it could be done maybe one day a week, like I see the patient on Thursday morning and then goes to cardiology in the afternoon. And a cardiology is right across the hall from OB. You walk right out of the OB clinic across the hall into the cardiology clinic. So, you know, getting the patient there <laughs> shouldn't have been an issue. Um, but unfortunately, the people that started those conversations have left. The two cardiologists have been assigned to other Emory facilities. So we do have, um, I was approached by an interventional cardiologist here last week who's very interested in this project and um, another um, new cardiologist who is particularly interested in women's health that want to join a conversation for getting this formalized clinic set up. And I think it's very, I think it's really important for us here at Grady with all the comorbidities we have that put a patient at risk for cardiac issues. We really need to jump on board and get things uh, going. Right now, we do have um, an internal medicine doctor who sees OB patients on Monday afternoons with, for concerns about cardiac issues. She reviews their, you know, their histories and labs and EKGs and then helps us determine this is a patient that needs an echo and then she needs to go to cardiology clinic or you know, we need to adjust her medication. She probably isn't, um, you know, isn't needing an echo at this point. So she's quite interested in this bundle um, and her input will be invaluable based on what um, she's seen so far. I think, um, you know, we're really looking forward to Dr. Hamid's talk, uh, Grand Rounds at Grady on, um, at Emory on October 5th. I had thought about approaching her and I've met her at a couple of meetings and, you know, she's always saying, just please call, call me. I'll be happy to help y'all as you're trying to get these cardiac bundles set up. So I wanted us here at Grady and at Emory to hear her, what she has to say about making this bundle work. So I'm glad that we'll be able to make the, our grand rounds available statewide to anybody who wants to listen because we've gotten um, interest from like OB card, uh, anesthesiologists, from the cardiologist, from, you know, ER docs. So we don't want to limit it to just OBs. We'd like anybody who wants to listen, any service, be able to hear what um, Dr. Hamid has to say. And I think um, I have heard, and Kathy or Dr. Duty can correct me if I'm wrong, for our patients in the postpartum period um, with hypertensive disorders, I think they're being given a follow-up postpartum appointment with cardiology um, to help assess what they need during the postpartum period. And I think that's gonna be uh, really helpful for us. And then we have been looking here at Grady um, at a possible screening tool may modeled after the one that's used in California and the one that Dr. Bird has put together 
um, here in Georgia, we we're looking to have a resident do a sort of a quality initiative where we develop a screening tool that could be easily administered in clinic or uh, to patients presenting in labor and delivery to help identify early warning signs of cardiac disease or either, you know, emergent signs so that we can get the patients to labor and delivery um, so that they can be assessed appropriately or have follow-up in um, a cardiology clinic. And just like Chad said, it's really important to have a good working relationship with your cardiologist. I know not all hospitals have that, but we're very fortunate here at Emory that we, and at Grady, that we feel we do have a good uh, working relationship with a cardiologist and they are, um, they are eager to uh, put in place um, a, a clinic or some type of service to help our pregnant patients because I think they're very much aware of uh, cardiac disease being the leading cause of maternal mortality, not just here in Georgia, um, but nationally and wanting to do something to make a change in that. So we'll look forward to working with everybody on the initiative and in GAP QC, uh, as well as with our colleagues here at Grady and throughout the Emory system to get something up and going that's going to make a difference for our patients. That's it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Uh, looks like Dr. Ray's got a question for you. I'm not sure if you can see the chat, but he's just wondering about the virtual link for the um, Grand Rounds, how you all kind of think about getting that out. I know we're going to be partnering with GAPQC, right? So we're going to be putting a flyer to out um, for our teams uh, with that link. Um, and, just... also, and also through the uh, through Georgia OBGYN Society, we'll have something there. Um, it's you know, I don't have a, 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 we're doing some word of mouth because I've gotten a couple of calls from cardiologists, from OB anesthesiologists wanting to know, uh, be sure that they get the link. So we're working on how to make it, you know, known across the state. If you have any ideas or uh, we'll make sure that all the medical directors from the perinatal centers um, have the link, have the link uh, so that you can share with any providers too, but we still need, you know, like EMS and emergency room providers and so forth too. So um, we want as many people as possible to just to participate. It will be recorded uh, also if people do not have the chance to watch live. That's and a great think, question. question. And I think we're working on I think we're working on CMEs for that uh, grand rounds too. Thanks, Dr. Ellis. I mean, Caprice has a great question here. Do we have a way to share with ER providers? Um, and, you know, we have a working group that's been meeting for about a year. Um, we do have some emergency medicine folks on board, and we utilize our work group members to kind of spread the spread the word of all of our events, and we'll do that um, as well. But if there's anybody on this call um, that is aware of any sort of uh, champion in this space, we're always looking to recruit, um, you know, the emergency medicine side of things into this work. So um, please, please do reach out if there's if there's a shining star with a lot with some with not a lot of time with some time to um, um, help this group move move along. Um, so thanks for all those questions. And uh, Dr. Callens, we appreciate you so much. Um, so I'll just hand it over to you for your Liberty Regional Medical Center. <laughs> awesome work that y'all are doing there. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I hear you great. Perfect. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you again for the opportunity to share. I am here as a representative of a large um, actually a small but mighty group that's been working together um, at Liberty Regional Medical Center. And um, I do locums call there to help out the um, OBGYN there, Dr. Borkway. And um, as a result of, of that working relationship and then um, being connected with um, Caprice, who's with the Georgia OBGYN Society, and then Ariane from the um, from the Georgia Family Connection Partnership. And then we've also um, enrolled or recruited um, some help from Amerigroup. And now we have the Annie E. Casey Foundation. And so through this um, collaboration, we've been able to put together some funds. So just so you know, um, Liberty Regional Medical Center is one of um, only two critical access hospitals left in the state of Georgia. And so we all know that we have an issue in terms of access to care. And so the really interesting thing about um, the program that we're working on, Mom's Heart Matters, is that Liberty Regional already had a program in place where they were starting to really monitor um, their postpartum moms in terms of being able to, to connect them to a cardiologist um, after discharge. 
And so when we started building this program, we wanted to just really level up on the things that were already, already happening there. And so it's a small hospital. Um, the volume is not very big, but it is kind of the perfect platform for us to pilot a project that we could then scale up and share that information with other communities. So the way that it works is really strictly postpartum. Once we have a mom that's identified, either we knew that they had postpartum um, if they have um, gestational hypertension or they develop preeclampsia, then they're asked to enroll in our program. We do that before their discharge. They do receive um, some teaching on how to use a blood pressure cuff. We do have that cuff that's provided to them. And then we have um, a platform um, that will be rolling out through GOMO to where we can actually, they can the blood pressure will be automatically uploaded to our system and we'll have alerts so that we can intervene. Right now, even though we haven't gone live, which will happen probably in October of this year, we've been doing that manually. So we have a dedicated cell phone um, that the um, nurse coordinator for the perinatal services, Heather, who I'm helping out with this presentation today, um, she has a cell phone where we can communicate with the patients. And so once they leave, we have um, check in with them twice a day regarding blood pressures. And if they have an elevated blood pressure, um, she will reach out to one of the physicians that's on call and we can either initiate medication, we can change medication, or we can have them go to the ER, we can have them come in, um, whatever needs to happen. And so the goal is through this pilot program is to really be able to um, expedite recognizing issues and then also expedite our intervention. And by that, decreasing the number of admissions that we have to the emergency room, hopefully, and also decreasing adverse outcomes for mom. So the unique thing about our program is that the platform with the, mo the GOMO um, system, it'll automate um, how the blood pressures are reported because right now, sometimes patients may or may not take it and you want it, which is twice a day. Um, but with that platform, it'll just help us to track the blood pressures uh, much better. And then we have a system or a calendar, which I can review with you briefly. So really um, day two, day four, and day seven, we're tracking those blood pressures. On day seven, they have an appointment with their OBGYN, which is Dr. Borkway usually. And then on day 10 to 14, we have an appointment with our local cardiologist, who of course is very kind about seeing our postpartum moms. The way that we're starting to build it out right now is we have almost like a floating available appointment. So that way if someone delivers on the weekend or in the week, we know that that very next week or the week after, there's a slot that's available that we can plug that person into. And again, we're a small um, hospital and we don't have a large volume. So right now we can allow things to happen that way. In addition, we do have additional follow-up that's done with our cardiac rehab program. So one of the things that we are trying to incorporate into our program is how we monitor their mental health. So their enrollment and some of the questions that they have will look at the mental health aspect, look at postpartum depression. We actually also are planning to incorporate um, there's a scale that's available, um, the Barkin Index, which looks at maternal functioning, which is a little bit different than postpartum depression. You know, how moms are adjusting to being a new mom and their function and their ability to, to do things in the home and how that impacts their overall health. We'll also be able to look at things like substance abuse and refer them to resources. We're going to be looking at breastfeeding. We're going to be looking at contraception. So we're using this platform um, to track their blood pressures, but also to extend and build a relationship that we have with our patients. We know that a good number of our moms, we lose them in the first um, six weeks, but an even higher percentage of moms that have um, developed car complications happen throughout the first year or the remainder of that year. And so our cardiac program will allow us to um, work on lifestyle changes, weight management, exercise. We're gonna build all of those lifestyle things into the follow-up that patients have over time. And hopefully with the expansion of Medicaid and the availability of services, we can use that to kind of propel um, that support system that we're going to be using for our moms. So that's kind of the short version. Um, we do have a flyer that I think that Lisa can drop into the chat. Um, we just presented this um, for the first time at the Georgia OBGYN Society annual meeting that happened, I believe it was last weekend. And so um, that's something that you can take a look at. Um, I'd welcome feedback. I don't know that we have the capacity and the time for that today, but um, for everyone that's on the call, we would love for you to take a look at this to see how it's outlined. We would love to get feedback, suggestions um, on other things that we may need to put on this flyer. This is going to be more on the provider um, network side. Um, and then we'll, of course, develop something that's more on the patient side and the family side. Um, but this is just a, a quick summary. And um, I wanted to give credit. Um, Mom's Heart Matters was a name that was actually um, 
birthed by Dr. Borkway, who's our OBGYN that's there in um, in Liberty County. And so we had several meetings and, and that was his idea and we just called MHM. So I wanted to um, make sure everyone knows that he is the, the one that gave, um, <laughs> gave us that name for the program. So that's it, I'm available for questions. Hey Keisha, it's Dr. Alice. Uh, good to see you again. Um, so this is the hospital that's in Hinesville, correct? Yes, uh -huh, okay. Liberty Regional. Mm -hmm. Which is a really small town and small hospital, so it's amazing what you guys have been able to do there. Who supports you if you have a significant cardiac issue? Do your patients go to Savannah? Are you able to transfer them to Savannah or to yes. Jacksonville if needed? Yes. Provided that Savannah Memorial is not in diversion, we'll go to Savannah, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good work mm -hmm. down there. You're welcome. Thank you. Caprice, are you online? Did you want to say anything? Caprice is one of our core team members. Well, nothing from me. Thanks, Dr. Callens. You did a good <laughs> job. Thanks, dear. Any other questions, comments, suggestions? We're open. We're still building. Hi, Dr. Collins. This is the Fozy SQ from the Georgia AAP. And um, I just wanted to share briefly. Um, I was on this um, uh, or participating in a, um, an event that NAMI had around um, equity, you know, um, bias, et cetera, um, that, you know, individuals experience when they access healthcare. And I was struck and I and I hope you guys will allow me sharing. Um, one of the individuals had had twins and, you know, she'd gone in and everything was fine. And then she's being rushed down, you know, for um, an emergency C-section. And um, the thing that she said to me that struck me was um, as she was going down the hall, she just really didn't know what she was going to face. And she was thinking about outcomes. She was a woman of color and she knew the statistics. And I guess I just wanted to place that out there for the group just to consider, because um, I love this. I, I, and I love everything that you guys, and that, you know, that everybody said, and that I'm still thinking about her going down the hall. And, and what do we do to capture that moment and, and uh, provide to set her at ease as best we can? So thanks for letting me share that. Thank you, and and I'll just respond quickly. So, um, you know, the the term that we're using now is respectful care. That's the term that is starting to weave its way into what we're doing. And I think that um, I will tell you the population in Hinesville is is very diverse. We have um, patients of different colors and sizes, and from different places, and rural and more rural. And so we do see all of that. And I think one of the things that's really important about what we're doing is even though we're we're using the hypertension, the postpartum monitoring as the connection, but really we're building a bridge because we're starting to form that relationship that will allow them to tell us if they're not feeling well, why are you not feeling well? Um, I've enrolled a couple of patients while I've been on call and it's interesting the things that you learn about what's impacting people. Like, you know, they may live an hour away, but they may end up staying close to the hospital if we ask them because their mom is close to the hospital. And so just being able to build that relationship, we have really good nurses on staff and um, we're working on training them as well in terms of doing the enrollments. But um, maybe we have an advantage because it's a smaller community and smaller hospital. Um, we see a lot of diversity. But I think that we have been very intentional about helping our moms understand that we're there to help them have good outcomes for themselves and their babies. And the interesting thing is, when it comes to blood pressure monitoring, we had one patient recently who absolutely refused to do everything we told her to do. She actually came in um, when Dr. B was on call and she was abrupting. We almost lost mom and baby. She absolutely refused to monitor blood pressure, refused to come to the hospital, refused to do her 24 hour urine protein, like the whole thing. And so there are some cases where we do our best and we don't get there. But most of our moms, when they do see that we care and we're genuinely interested, we're calling them in the morning, we're calling them in the evening, borderline being annoying, we get that responsiveness. And I do think it gives them assurance that we're doing everything we can to help them be there for their kids. And so, I think it, it just has to be intentional. It takes time to do that. And I can see how in a big hospital with limited staff and the volume being higher, that's harder to do. Um, but we'll get more creative over time as we figure that out. But I know that it can be done because we're doing it at Liberty. 
Yeah, we're, we're excited to to hear about more of the learnings you all will be having with this. And it's just fantastic um, what you all are doing. And I did want to ask you, Dr. Collins, because I know the sort of the goal of this call is really kind of to understand how how folks built their teams or how do they start even thinking about building their teams. And I know you all had some good movement in the beginning, right? Like you had dedicated OBs, um, cardiology was invested. Um, and so we've gotten some feedback from some of our rural facilities that, you know, we, we're having some challenges getting the right people at the at the table. Um, do you have any nuggets or anything that you could share um, for those facilities that may not have as much or maybe they don't see, a, you know, a good pr proportion of patients with cardiovascular disease or um, but any any nuggets that you could share for those facilities? So I'd say that the, the village has to be pretty big. I don't live in Hinesville. Um, I actually practice in Twiggs County and Jones County, two other rural communities. And so it just so happens that because of my um, going there to work occasionally and then having a relationship with Caprice and then Ariane and just building. And so really um, for communities that have, have um, that are small and rural, um, you have to build those bridges outside of your community and having people who are already interested and then bringing them to those smaller communities. And so hopefully we can be a model for that. We were fortunate, as I mentioned before, because they were already they already had that postpartum cardiac follow-up and there are other cardiologists in the area who were not as thrilled about seeing postpartum women but luckily we did identify one that was and so we will have to employ other um, modalities such as telemedicine to be able to expand that safety net and it just really needs to be intentional and so i think that um you know, Liberty Regional can become um, kind of like the lighthouse or the hub for some other surrounding communities as, as we build this out. Once we kind of get some of the kinks worked out, I will make, um, mention one thing though, you, you always learn things when you interact with patients. So I had um, the last patient that we enrolled, um, I ended up sending her home on labetalol and hydralazine. Um, she had some really impressive blood pressures, did not have any issues um, prenatally. And when I talked to her on day one, she said, you know, I feel really sleepy and tired. And I didn't know I was going to feel like that. And so part of it is, could it be the in impact of the medicine or is it just the fact that she had a vaginal delivery and she labored for two days? It could be a combination of both. But we're learning those nuggets about how to counsel patients because her first question to me was, can I stop this medicine? And in my head, you know, looking at blood pressures of 181 over 118, I'm like, absolutely not. And so, you know, how we counsel and how we engage our moms is really key. We made sure that she had someone at home so that if she felt sleepy, she could lay down, she could continue her regimen. And the last time I checked in with Heather, when she talked to her, her blood pressures were like 120s over 80s and she's on both meds and she's still taking them. But it did take an initial period for that to happen. And so I think sometimes we forget, it's easy to write that prescription <laughs> and to say, hey, go pick it up at the pharmacy. But then, you know, how new moms are adjusting to taking care of a baby and the medicine and all the other things we're asking them to do, it can be very overwhelming. And then we're gonna be asking questions about mental health and contraception, and we're gonna really lay it on thick. But I do think, again, that relationship is key. And that is what will be the game changer for a lot of what we're doing for our patients. That's great, thank you. And I did want to, hi Lisa, I just want to add also is that, you know, really engaging with community partners, you know, everyone is really focused on maternal mortality and morbidity. And so you don't have a shortage of organizations, nonprofits and community groups who are interested in this work. So being able to find out who in your community is doing this. We, we looked at like family connection partnership. We didn't know they have um, a hub in every county almost could they do some of the home visitation portion? Like, so just identifying what could, what the community network looks like, who you could leverage, who you could engage with. Because in the hospital, it's one thing to build that. You know, every team, but once moms leave, they can fall the cracks because there is no community level support to motivate them, to sort of, you know, encourage them and support them in continuing to follow up on their healthcare needs. So engaging with those community level partners, I think is what we all talk about, but that's where really the gaps lie, is that once these moms get back into their communities, there is no sort of network once they have their baby to continue to support them. So I would just say engage your community partners and know who they are and where they are. Agreed completely and Family Connections has been great. We've had a lot of help also and um, interest from the health department and so we're leveraging all available resources to um, to build that village for our moms. Uh, it looks like Fozio has a question here. Um, 
Um, are the hospitals including re family representatives on their teams? That might be for you, Dr. Kellens. So we actually have, and Caprice can help me out with this too, um, there um, is a lot of history in Hinesville. Um, there was actually a mom who was very active um, with um, their heart health that passed away um, a couple, actually, I think almost 10 years postpartum, but she developed cardiovascular issues after her delivery. And so we do have a lot of community support. Um, right now, we do not have a family member on our core team, but we're not too far from doing that as we're getting ready to roll things out in October. And the goal is to have all available on, on hands on board. There's one thing that Dr. Joy Baker said um, that has stuck with me for quite some time, you know, nothing about me without me. And so we are very committed to making sure that um, we are reflecting the needs of the community and that we're being responsive. If we get it wrong because of something we thought, we're gonna fix that. We're gonna do it real time. Great, and I, I see Rose has a question here. What is the name of the index you're using to de determine well-being? Okay, so we're using the Barkin Index of Maternal Functioning. That's the one that I mentioned that we're going to be incorporating. So that's still something that we're working on how we're going to do that. And then we're using the PHQ-2, which will level up to the PHQ-9 if we need it. So, and we do have, we're building out the um, what's the fun, the fancy word, the logic model and the responses that will happen, what will go to the provider or the nurse that's managing the responses, then also what's the follow up that goes to the patient as well. And so we're currently building um, what that platform looks like as well. Um, but the reason that's important is because, you know, when we think about depression and, and we think about behavioral health, I ask my moms all the time, jokingly, you know, do you feel like throwing your baby out the window? <laughs> they should laugh and tell me no, right? It's an absurd question unless they get quiet, then I know there's a problem. But there's so much more to what moms experience that cannot be defined just by that depression scale. And so we're hoping to tap into that and then use it as an opportunity to help provide them and link them to resources that are already available in the community. Yeah, these are just such great points. Just, you know, really engaging your community partners and champions and the providers that are, you know, um, you know, willing to see moms um, and the cardiologists that are willing to see moms. And so I think I'll do one more plug, one shameless plug for that survey of the referral network, because that's really what we're trying to capture. We're trying to capture those, um, you know, clinicians that are wanting to, that serve, you know, um, maternal patients and that are invested in this. And so we want to create a resource, um, statewide resource for that. So that's my last plug for that survey to complete. But I just wanted to thank everyone today. And I'll, I'll um, oh, we have one more question. Uh, I know Fosia, Fosia's got a lot of a passion around social determinants of health. It is part of the cardiac bundle. Uh, we will need to be tracking this um, screening and we have some tools that we have from um, our Ohio friends and um, that we're going to be sharing with our teams. I think it's about seven screening tools that are our, um, our PQCs across the country are using. So more to come on that. But how are you screening for social disturbance of health? Um, I know Brooks Publishing has an instrument, but there's also a survey of child well-being and young children that includes PHQ2 and some food insecurity questions. So I would have to get back to you on what how we're incorporating incorporating that into our enrollment. Um, but I wanted to mention um, another thought that I had, and I lost my thought. Mm -hmm. Caprice, do you want to add to that about how we're screening specifically for social determinants? No, I don't know if we're screening specifically for social. We don't have a tool that we're using for, to screen for social determinants of health, but because we're connecting mom to the resources that are available, it is a part of um, one of the, um, the GOMO chat that we've created, that that interaction between the platform and the mother. Some of the questions get at the social determinants of health, and we've been very intentional about making sure that we address those for moms, so connecting them to vital resources. So when I say resources, I mean housing, I mean food, I mean all of those things. So we're intentional about, yes, we're taking care of the healthcare needs, but the social needs become so important because those create additional stressors. So we have included that into the um, the platform as what resources will we have available to moms? What information will we be giving to them? What will we make available to them? Those are the ones that are identified that really focus intentionally on the social determinants like housing, food, employment, all of those things. So we've been intentional about including that.
And we've recently, um, we do have um, now as one of our partners, Morehouse School of Medicine, um, Dr. Livingston is going to be helping us with our evaluation component and really beginning with the end in mind. And so if you have some suggestions for tools that are available, we would be more than happy for you to share those with us and direct us that way. Um, I will tell you that I am <laughs> just a practicing physician, and so I don't always know. I do have some public health background, but you know we're always interested um, for how we can do things better. And so please, please share that information. And I'll just end with one last thought. You know, every hospital's program might look a little bit different because we have different resources, we have different capacity. Um, but the goal at the end of the day is to make sure that when our moms leave the hospital they remain healthy and there are so many instances where that does not happen for so many reasons and we have to get better about asking the right questions which speaks to what you're talking about with social terms of health we had a mom that we wanted to um send home and we found out that she had no electricity she had no food we were able to connect with a local food bank we were able to get a food box on the weekend i mean it's just amazing how many things are available in the community and that's not the job of one person it really is the job of everyone involved in that mom's care and so hopefully with time we'll get better about that and not have to reinvent the wheel with each patient that we um, have difficulties with and I know it's three o'clock, it's time to go, but we did one of our MFM fouls and Dr. Duty, if you know what happened with the study, please chime in, uh, did a social determinants of health study here at Grady where I think a patient was surveyed every time she came to clinic. So at least we have some type of tool available. I'm not sure what's happened to that study since the fellow has gone. Carolyn, do you have any idea? No, but I do know, well, I think it's, Led into a bigger study, the Minding the Gap study, but it has, they didn't make a social determinants wheel that gets filled in in clinic. So it's almost like a monitor, just like we would do a like depression scale, mm -hmm. so that you can kind of monitor how patients are with their social determinants of health at every visit and therefore refer as needed um, to the services that we have, which has been helpful. Right. And we do find that patients have food insecurity, housing insecurity, I think more than any of us ever realized. Or that they're willing to admit unless right, we just exactly. have to make them comfortable telling us. I've had patients say, well, you know, I'm living in a hotel. I don't have a refrigerator or a stove. That's not something yeah. I would normally know unless, you know, I pin them up against the wall and <laughs> squeezed it out of them. <laughs> so. so we'll be happy to talk to your Morehouse colleague if you want us to about what we did here at Grady. Yes, yes, we will definitely do that with Dr. Livingston. That would be awesome. Thank you so much for allowing us to share our program and um, we have a small but mighty partnership and we're excited about it. Thank you so much, Dr. Callens, and, and thank you so much, Dr. Ray and Dr. Ellis. We appreciate you taking the time to share some wisdom on this. And um, yes, if there's any tools that anybody wants to share and can share, please do send them my way. We are have a repository of um, you know cardiac uh, resources on Microsoft Teams. Um, that we're going to continually be growing. I just want to call attention to this video that is on up there right now, taken from the 2021 International Virtual Sy Cardio Obstetrics Virtual Symposium, talking about how to build your maternal cardiology team and why it's necessary, and then all these resources that are up there right now for those with access. So please do take some time to be in there, um, and just please contact me if you are interested in enrolling in our cardiac initiative. So thanks again for everybody, everyone joining today, and for our present pre presenters. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Thank you. Thanks. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.